Welcome, folks, to another episode of The Wormhole. And I'm really excited today because of who our guest is. It's a person very dear to my heart with all that she does. And it's a real, real pleasure to have Dr. Claire Nelson on the set. So a lady of the future. Welcome once again, Claire. So nice to have you on The Wormhole with us. So I know you have this as you're talking about um, storytelling and, and performance, the um, the first Jamaican on the moon. Um, it's a performance. Uh, Tell me yeah. what motivated that and a little bit what it's about. Oh, well, what motivated that really is that I want, again, the idea of building planetary consciousness. When I looked at the SDGs, I said I need a device by which I can speak to any audience about what it is they're trying to create. So I have to go far enough in the future because most people are working here and they're not able to keep the vision in mind. So I thought, well, if I was on the moon, I get to talk about anything. So we're going to uh -huh. need everybody to get us to the moon. People are already planning to be on the moon anyway. And yes. I searched around, should I write a play that's for anybody to perform? Then I realized, no, because if I write it for anybody to perform, um, that doesn't use my, my, my archetype. The archetype of somebody from a small country creating this is very odd. In yes. Other words, if it was an American, it wouldn't have the same impact because um, they already they can't actually do it. But for yeah, a they, they can, to pick up and say they're going to try and create a global movement to build a village on the moon. And the right. theme here was sports 2040. Mm -hmm. So basically, I wrote about the space goodwill games on the moon okay so that is now one of the stories that i tell in my show my uh -huh. show now has three pieces to it one piece is how i created the vault of human lunar heritage so this uh -huh. is what i collect all these folk tales so what i'm doing now in real life is i'm collecting um stories from different um you know cultures, the Maori culture, Aboriginal culture, Native American culture about how the moon came to be, those kinds uh -huh. of things. So we collect those things. And um, I'm anticipating that when we do get to the point where we have uh, a, a village on the moon, that it should not just contain just the you know things that mine the moon. And as one drink, in fact, what I use as my insight in story is I'd gone to this conference and I heard this man say, this is in real life now, not a story. He said, the moon is up there just doing nothing. Interesting statement. And I'm like, so that's why we should go up there and mine it. I'm like, <laughs> he said, I was screaming. Ah! But my face was trying to look like, and I'm going like, ah, ah, and my moon is screaming. So I really feel like those of us who are scientists who still believe that there is more to life than just science and materiality right. and material wealth have got to be more active and more vocal in the science movement and no, no longer be embarrassed to talk about your spirituality when you're at the table. It is not serving us because those people are running away with this yes. the agenda. They don't see this. And then we're going to continue to design things that ultimately lead to our destruction. Yeah, that's actually a very important point that you've raised, um, where you are seeing things now in silos. Science is separate from religion, from spirituality. You're right, it's really important to bring everything to the table, especially the culture and the heritage that you're mentioning. You, you're right, our entire Caribbean region, its history, its stories, mythologies, can get left behind in this um, futuristic and technological world that we are in. So that's so wonderful, some of the things that you're doing. Claire, I get so excited. Yeah, go ahead. And let me tell you that last year I did Moon, moon Runnings, the full version. The last story, I start with the Vault of Human Heritage and I had some ad lib in between. Then the second story is how, how no, no longer I, because it's the create. so we now have a group called the Upstarts. Right. But I have to create the Upstarts. So the Upstarts now, got the space games going, we have that going. And the last thing is that somebody in the upstarts decided that, you know, since the faith community controls so much of people's minds, they should also uh -huh. have something on the moon. And there's a whole big argument, da, 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 but we now have the chapel of our religion on the moon because we can't expect people who go to the moon to all be atheists. So some of them are going to want to have to 
you all going to want to worship when they're on the moon. So what should that look like? Because you can't have separate things now. You'll have one chapel of all religions. And uh -huh. so the story, my story ends there. And I try to leave it open-ended. So there's space okay. now for people to add their answer. Yeah, yeah. And the question I leave people with at the end of the show is how will we share space? If yeah, right. assume, borrowing from the Native Americans construct that the cosmos do not belong to humans, we belong to the cosmos. Oh, that's just beautiful. And um, as you said, you know, the whole consciousness of um, planetary society. And we are, I mean, we are on the verge to um, being on the moon on a regular basis. I mean, it's going to now you and I will see that happening all being well. Um, yes. It really requires a different mindset. I always remember reading that when the first astronauts that went up on the moon and then they looked down, at planet earth one of the things they mentioned is they saw they saw no borders there were no boundaries it was one planet and that's where the whole notion of the big blue marble came and then you realize the fragility of our planet and us as a single humanity you know not all these countries and borders and regions fantastic stuff oh, so many things i want to ask you but one of the things that i mentioned when i introduced you is that you're a white house champion for change Tell us about their journey that, you know, that took you to there, because that is so inspiring. I think how it goes, when, when the Obama administration was in, in, in play, they started a program to recognize ordinary Americans that were doing extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. I think the program lasted about a year. And maybe three weeks out of four, they would do maybe eight to, maybe eight to 12 people. Um, they would honor for a particular subject matter. So my subject matter was Chambers of Change for Connecting the Americas. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. And so when the names were banded about, this is what my friend told me now, my friends were banded about, they realized that there were no Caribbean people, they were all only Latin Americans. So I think- Very important point you just raised. I'm very aware of that. Mm -hmm. So last minute, of course, oh my God, I forgot the Caribbean. Okay, well, hoo, 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 hoo. And some <laughs> things were banded about. So she said, she said, you had two votes, two strong champions at the State Department. Myself and, and, and at the then Caribbean director at the State Department for my work, not only in building ICS, because by this time, we were the ones that had been running Caribbean American Heritage Month, doing stuff on the Hill since 1999, advocating. So they saw from a civil society, I was really the only group that had been that consistent doing that. And then she said, but it's not only that, your work at the IDB in connecting the African diaspora from Argentina to Canada. Yeah. It was transformational. So yeah. those are, and because the IDB eventually took up the issue and there's now a program called Development, Diversity and Development, mm -hmm. the Development Equity, I, I actually started that term in the bank mm -hmm. on my business card before it became an approved job title. <laughs> Don't forget that day. It's leadership. <laughs> yes, create what has, did not exist yeah. before. So honored. So that's what made it happen. It's the, my work in those two places. Congratulations and congratulations. And like I tell you, it's very inspiring for us. Um, the There's a point that you made about us getting subsu uh, subsumed into Latin America because, you know, it's LAC, Latin America and the Caribbean. And yes. it's something that has troubled me too, especially the English speaking Caribbean. Yes. It's just a handful of islands. And when you compare it to Latin America, you know, it's a much bigger region and honestly with more resources and things. So it's really important to, for the Caribbean voice, which you've been giving us. So kudos yes. on that. <laughs> All Thank right. you so much. Uh, yeah. So I'm um, talking about the Caribbean region. And as in your introduction, I mentioned that you are a futurist and our conversations have been showing that. What do you see as some of the biggest problems for the, um, well, globally for the English speaking Caribbean on the grand scale of things? I think that for me, my, well, domestically, I'm really focused on environment and equity. Mm -hmm. because um, we now see 
the high levels of indiscipline and criminality that's threading throughout the region at all levels. Yes. From slowly man in the street to the highest mm -hmm. seats of government, we have indiscipline and criminal behaviors, right? So, I, I, so development in that sense has not served us um, in, terms right. of our, in terms of our, let's say, social development is not where it should be. We might have nice buildings and highways and roads, but I yeah. don't know if are off socially and culturally. So there's that. Then secondly, I'm very concerned about the environmental issues because we still don't have a very strong environmental movement that looks at issues like biodiversity, our management of the Caribbean Sea as, as matters of life and death. They don't. I think we don't have enough champions in government that are true to that uh -huh. in, as a matter of expediency. And so now we have this, this, this climate crisis, but because we don't have smart government, we don't have people who think about the generational impact of their choices. We don't have people who really look at the fisher folk and see them as usually having the same common sense. So, so many people in the development community in the Caribbean and everywhere else in the world, quite frankly, yeah. are operating in a very paternalistic or maternalistic, if you want to call it that. But I would say more paternalistic. Do as we say, as if to say the people at the bottom don't have any wisdom. Okay, they may not be educated to use the right technological terms, right, or equations, but the intelligence that allows people like you and I to go ahead and get our PhDs exists at all levels. They just didn't have the opportunity to execute it. So uh, that's even right. before, they're very highly intelligent people that if you explain a problem in language that they understand, they can explain the solution in ways that they have thought about it. And if we would just take the time to understand that they too have agency and allow their aspirations to take a place at the table, we might get better designs. So we can indeed have thriving futures. Some islands will no longer exist in the next 30 years if sea level rise is what it is started to be. Have we begun to talk about that? So we're still talking about shoring up, fixing, mitigating. I don't hear the conversation about where are these people going to move to? Oh. Um, living in the Caribbean myself, I totally um, understand these points that you're raising, and we tend to not have that very long-term vision. At the international level, I would say I'm disappointed that the mm -hmm. CARICOM functional cooperation um, units have not seen fit to take better advantage of the diaspora that uh -huh. does this, to fill some of the gaps, gaps they have in right. terms knowledge gathering yes and support because we have diaspora if we, if the university of the many universities we have for example maybe short-term people that know x y and z but we have diaspora that know x y and z in almost every country in the world we will not short yeah. knowledge it may not be yeah. in the physical location but we've kept the caribbean nation the caribbean global nation has all the talent we need there's somebody mm -hmm. who knows about submarines. There's somebody who knows That's about... Very true. So yeah. those are the conversations I had hoped to get started by now with the Caribbean Futures Movement. But right. unfortunately, I've not really been able to find the people who believe as passionately as I do in this right. idea of a Caribbean Futures Forum being stood up so we can begin to have these conversations within the region and then within the Caribbean nation. And by nation, I mean wherever we are in the world, not just the Caribbean islands. So, yeah, so just uh, jumping off that same point, what do you see as our biggest strengths and resources as a Caribbean people? Wow, uh, people, wow, we have some people. And I've, I mean, if I'm anything to go by and you're anything to go by, when we dream, we dream big. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, well, whether it's the Olympics or Nobel laureates, there's somebody from the Caribbean at the highest maybe, level. Maybe it is that we go to the beach and we look out and we're seeing the sky and we're seeing the horizon. Or maybe it is people like ourselves, but even, even some of the people who are born today, they still have that dreaming big idea. So we yes. dream very big. I think we also have resilience. In short, I would say, in Jamaicans we would say we're little, but we're Talawa. And that is really Talawaness, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Which is added, which is defined as the ability to have an impact far, far larger than your size and your weight class. That's right. who we are fundamentally. And although it's a Jamaican saying, I think it applies across the region. Yes, yes, definitely. I think that is the spirit of our people. So that's just wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to bring you back to a more a, a topic that's actually very um, popular right now because of a development uh, in technology. And as a futurist, I want to get your thoughts on um, what do you think, what's your opinion on the chat GPT thing that we are seeing and artificial intelligence, they're going to take away our <laughs> jobs. And is it going to make a bigger divide between the developed countries and the developing countries or is it going to help everybody? Okay. In a more so my first instinct is like to be terrified, right? Um and people say, okay, you don't have to be terrified, don't be afraid. Well, I have to look at both the good and the bad, right? Mm -hmm. So the capabilities that exist today, before we even get into quantum computing are quite frightening. Yeah. The, and this is why my book is so important because we don't have yet, I would say, a, a planetary ethic that is about, first of all, let us all survive. So you have this primitive brain, alien mm -hmm. brain, that is now have these tools, that's frightening. So that's on the negative side because we don't have the rules yet worked out. We don't have the laws and the policies yet worked out to manage this instrument, right? So there's that. So everything's at risk. We have to very rapidly get literacy. The, 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 we have to get a set of we have to get an AI literacy manual into every person's head, which is about how do I know something is real? How do I know that? How do I question what I'm seeing? Because mm -hmm. you now we have more abilities to manipulate photographs, manipulate data, yes. information, mimic people. We don't even know the person. Somebody could create a very good version of me that is totally yeah. an AI person, give the person a whole life on the internet and all of a sudden people can post a picture of me doing something I never did, being yes. somewhere and this is very dangerous and we yes. don't have the laws yet so I am worried okay, yes future of life competition with some other people it was a small group of us, we didn't win but doing the exercise was very important. So now that this is happening, I think we have to go back and take our ideas that we have and uh -huh. really create this working group I thought about creating and now put it into play. Because we did all this work, we didn't win, but it doesn't mean we can't do something with what we did. Right. So we have to go back and get, we had created a whole world. We created the stories from 2045. And yes. I think it's time to put them out as real stories and books and maybe have an ongoing quarterly conversation about what does it mean for people from the people who are um not necessarily at the table because none of us are like you know at the table when mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. worked out but we can create a community of practice so there's that i have to say i was on the advisory board i think i still am a few months for ai but they have gone <laughs> quiet so maybe again we need to that group needs to regroup now that this is happening yes. and yes. really push out to form a global community of people will have these conversations to make yes. sure that enough people who are in the 99 percent are understanding and therefore being able to protest or advocate or whatever or educate um, yes what it is that we need to see happen at the local level which then becomes global if enough of us are doing it locally so those yeah. are some things i think personally i did write an article using chat gpt Okay, but yes. What I did was for my last essay for um, the future of 
piece or something I wrote in Human Futures. Human, human, human Futures magazine, of which I'm the editor at large, is mm -hmm. published um, through the auspices of the World Future Studies Federation, where I serve on the board. I'm sure I'm the first Caribbean mm -hmm. person on the board. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, the amount of stuff. <laughs> But but um, so I wrote a piece on um, if, you know, peace because it was Christmas season, December, beginning of the year, with your peace and love message kind of thing. I'm like, okay, but will we ever find peace? Peace is SDG 16. You had and, and I hear anybody talking about SDG 16, and I was like, well, what is ethics going to look like? I said, oh, and then Chat GBT had come out. Uh -huh. with before. I said, okay, let me see if the oracle. So I said, right. yes. Like, just, as, just as people went to Delphi, I will go to Chat GPT, the Oracle, to find what will be the future of ethics. So, <laughs> so I Googled the future of ethics. And I think I did it different times. Yes. You see, and eventually, and, and so in my essay, I have what it said. Uh -huh. I, did, I did the future of ethics, the future of morality, and the future of spirit, spirit to see how different they would be and they more or less were the same language with those different words ah. and I thought and then I think I ended my essay by saying well I may be the first person asking this question maybe I come back a year from now and uh -huh. see that it's the same or because chat GPT will have learned more about Learn. that, yes yes by then. what it will say so mm. I do start to ask the question again but I give it some time yeah, so it's a good experiment. I am not the one, so I am not the only person typing it in to see yes. what comes up if other people are looking at these terms, etc. So who knows? But my point is, I think that when I hear people say things like, and this, this is very important, oh, you know, it's going to allow us to go and do other things, you know, work with freedom. I'm like, well, which people are you talking about? It's because... It's one thing to get the boring tasks that we don't want to do done, but that takes away a job from somebody. Yeah, so all this excitement awesome. about walking to store, you don't have to pay anything. You just have like a chip in your fix in your finger. But if we can walk into a store and we have an implant that has a, a yeah. barcode and we don't have to pay for anything because the barcode has our whole life on it, yes. right? And then we walk in and it scans our face. So the face know that this face belongs to this person. And this person has this bank account, this, this ID number, this passport number, blah, blah, blah. this health record, everything. And so, yes, this is the prescription that they are authorized to buy. No, they can't buy this. I mean, where are we going? No, think about the jobs. The only people going to have jobs in that system are going to be the IT programmers and the cyber security people. Yes. People. So people say new jobs will be created but uh -huh. those two jobs won't be the same volume of jobs as the people right. we have it's movies that are dystopia sell better than um what i call new utopia new new topias I and mean, you right neutral topias a new topia is a topia a place that's in the future that is not everybody singing kumbaya uh -huh. living in a place that's dark and there's no sun and we're all behind right. bars like animals, we have to be able to have enough movies that conceptualize a utopia where we still are human, but we mm -hmm. have not got any worse. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that, that's right. And you know, movies have <laughs> such an influence of, you know, young people even watching them as to what we perceive our future as. So yeah. my dream is, one of my big dreams is, okay, maybe I can't get it. Caribbean Futures Forum started, but maybe, uh -huh. but maybe I can do one thing where there's a big group of people, but maybe I can do one thing by finding some funds, getting some funding together, come up with some prizes, even a smaller prize and say, okay, um, World Futures Day, we want to have short films, you can use your phone about the future you see with AI, for example. Right. Fact, yes. I think I will do that because World Futures Day, again, is going to be in, in December. So there's right. time to do and we offer that just in the region. So yeah, that would be wonderful. And then these things uh, allow the young people to think exactly. realistically, research and understand and, yeah, exactly. you know, be engaged. And so maybe I have, uh, maybe I do, do, do that as part of Ignite and have uh -huh. Ignite take the responsibility um, in terms of marketing it. 
there's going to be a global futures forum next uh -huh. year. Yes. And so we have got to do something different. So all of these NGOs are meeting. I found out about it last minute and I'm like, okay, what do we do now? So we have to do something. And yeah. maybe you just give me an idea. Thank you for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, make it, I think I'm going to make it a global thing and get the World Future Studies Federation to do it as their project. It's <laughs> an idea. Sounds super. <laughs> I'll pitch it and see what if if the board buys it. Okay. No, well, if anyone can, you can. <laughs> Claire. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. It's uh, scary. Sometimes it feels like the technology is running at such a fast pace that humans are struggling. And especially, you know, across different parts of the world, you know, trying lagging behind and trying to keep up. All right. I can talk to you for hours and hours, but we're going to um, begin to wrap it up. And one of the things that I, these are my signature questions, a little bit of fun questions <laughs> as um, in the wormhole. And one of it is, Claire, if you could be any animal, what would you choose to be? And I don't know if I have a permanent answer, mm -hmm. but my today answer. Yes, yeah, that's good. Is going to be elephant i would not have guessed a lot of times i ask my guests these um questions and you know you get the eagle and things like that this is the first elephant i've had any i think elephant because they are herders they look yeah. them and i'm primarily i used to say wolf at one because wolf also are pack pack animals i'm yes. not a loner i'm not a loner i'm, I, I'm a pack animal Mm -hmm. Elephants feel old and crinkly and they look old and crinkly and their leather is so tough. Um they don't want really to pick fights. Yeah. Because they're so big, right? Yes, yes. Um, but they will defend if attacked. Yeah, yeah. They and also they have very hard. long memories. Yes, and even and I think what I like about elephants is the idea of a long memory, okay. and they feel ancient, like they feel like they've been around since time begun. That's just, it, yeah, it's just how they, they look. Feel old, you know. <laughs> so today, I think I'd be an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, as an author yourself, I always find it fascinating to ask an author, "What's your favorite book, or one of your favorite books?" That's an embarrassing question. I don't think I have a favorite book. I'm not even going to say mine because. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so oh, I probably should have said, I said, I probably should say, right now, mine. <laughs> <laughs> so fair answer. It should I be. Don't, I don't read a lot of intelligent books for fun, right? Uh -huh. My intelligent books, I read them for learning to do something. Right. And so I would not read an intelligent book from cover to cover usually. So at mm -hmm. one point I'm reading a futures book, I'm reading something about AI, I'm reading a... I don't read a lot of real novels mm -hmm. that are intelligent because I'm always afraid of the end. <laughs> I'm very scared and I don't like bad endings. All right. Because my imagination is overactive. Mm -hmm. Okay, and interesting. I get into the character so much that I would live with the character for a long time. So I realized that was not a good use of my time. So that's why I also don't go, even though I love the movies. Right. I don't watch a movie unless someone tells me how it ends. Ah, uh, this is interesting. And if it doesn't that. end well, I'm not going because I don't want to live with that negative story for yeah. long as I to stay in my head. It doesn't, it takes me a long time. Oh, yes. it's well done. Because when I'm in there, I'm crying, I'm laughing, and, and I actually, I'm so engrossed in that world. Yeah, like I'm in the world, and then your brain doesn't know it's not real. Yeah. I have to monitor what I read, so I only okay. read optimistic books. I will read a, a an intelligent book if somebody tells me how it's going to end, and it, nobody important dies. That kind of yeah. stuff. I can't do that. So I don't have a favorite book, believe it or not. Okay, even, I, even though I do read a lot, because what I read a lot is mostly romantic historical novels that's my downtime reading so last question well not quite question more a statement from you that i'd asked for um in a few lines what is your message to the world smart futures 
<laughs> two words, two words. It's just brilliant. <laughs> Uh, no, smart futures for a flourishing world. That's my message. My book is my message. I uh -huh. truly believe that we are at an inspirational pause. We have some serious decisions to make as a species. Mm -hmm. And so my message is that we have to change our paradigm about what matters. And so smart futures for a flourishing world has to become a mantra. Leaders have to begin to say, we want to create smart futures and a flourishing world. And we want to use the design principles. So my book is about design principles. So we can have design in smart futures for a flourishing world, but it's using smart futures to create a flourishing world. And that's what we all that's want. My, message. my yes. book is my message. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful message full of hope and with a Happy endings, happy endings. That's what we want. So, Claire, this has been fascinating. Thank you for taking the time to join me for this interview. You've given us a lot to think about, to ponder upon. So, thanks once again, Claire, for joining us today. Thank and you for having me. Wonderful. And folks, and Ad Astra. Ad Astra. Yes, Ad Astra. And folks, I am your host, Sharon Hack, signing off from none other than Studio 42, where we seek to find the answers to life, the universe, and everything. Bye.